now on new books in the Society of Fellows. Um, fittingly, the entire panel is part of this community. Rebecca, Will, and Carl as former fellows. Matt as long-standing member of the board. Um, I think the program with their bios actually calls him the once and future member of the board. He's <laughs> <laughs> um, actually quite a mysterious member of the board, and we should figure that out in the session. And, um, Whitney Lamley and I, as members of the current crop of fellows, as well as the collective community here that makes up the Society of Fellows, are thrilled to be celebrating recent works published by Rebecca Woods, Matt Jones, and Will Derringer. Um, their books navigate different waters in the history of science, from the challenges facing animal breeders in early 19th century Britain, to the political power of numerical calculation in 17th century England, to the process of building calculating machines themselves in the 17th and 19th centuries. Um, as each work delves into the past, it hones in on urgent questions and historical developments that have in different ways helped shape the world today, whether we're thinking of uh, the livestock industry, uh, our obsession with numbers flashing on news sites to tell us about the state of the nation and the economy, um, or even the culture behind the technology we use to make our own calculations. So for the purposes of time, um, more complete biographies of our panelists can be found in the printed program, which if you haven't grabbed one, there are some on the edge of the table. Um, but I'm going to very briefly introduce all of our panelists before giving you a sense of how the evening's events will proceed. So Rebecca Woods is Assistant Professor at the Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Technology at the University of Toronto. Rebecca was a fellow here from 2013 to 2016, and we're very pleased to have her back here today to celebrate her wonderfully titled new book, The Herd Shot Round the World, Native Breeds and the British Empire, 1800-1900, published this year by UNC Press. Our second panelist is Matthew Jones, the James R. Barker Professor of Contemporary Civilization here at Columbia, as well as, as I also noted, a, a once and future member of the Society of Fellows. Uh, his, his previous publications include The Good Life in the Scientific Revolution, Descartes, Pascal, Leibniz, and the Cultivation of Virtue, published by Chicago in 2006. Tonight we'll be discussing his most recent book, Reckoning with Matter, Calculating Machines, Innovation, and Thinking About Thinking, from Pascal to Babbage, also published by Chicago. Will Derringer is the Leo Marx Career Development Assistant Professor of Science, Technology, and Society at MIT, and currently a fellow at the Davis Center at Princeton. He was a fellow here from 2012 to 2015, and tonight we'll be hearing more about his new book, Calculated Values, Finance, Politics, and the Quantitative Age, just published by Harvard University Press. And I'll mention again, all of these books, um, should you be so intrigued, are available for purchase just outside the door at the conclusion of our event. Um, we'll also be hearing from Carl Apun, Associate Professor of History and Italian Studies and Director of the Medieval and Renaissance Center at New York University, who is also a former fellow here from 1999 to 2001. Um, his book, um, which we won't be discussing uh, because it's already been so successful. Um, was a for his, his last book was A Forest on the Sea, Environmental Expertise in Renaissance Venice, published by Jones Hopkins in 2009, and won no fewer than three major book awards across categories in European history, conservation history, and Venetian studies. So one of the wonderful things about this event is that you'll be able to hear our panelists engage with each other's work. Um, so the format will be as follows. Um, each of our authors will introduce um, their book and then we'll have two responses from the other panelists. So we'll begin um, with a short um, introduction to her work by Rebecca. Will and Carl will respond. We'll then hear from Will, Matt and Rebecca will respond, and finally from Matt and Rebecca and Will. <laughs> so I'm going to try to keep um, us on track. Um, these should be kind of short, um, short comments from all of our panelists. Heidi and I will try and be trying to keep time rather conscientiously since yes. there's so many moving parts. Six to eight minutes um, short comments. In part because we just want to ensure that there's at least a little bit of time for questions from the audience before we retire. To the, to the lounge for some celebratory food and drink. Um, but for now, I will turn it over to Rebecca and let her introduce her book. Thank you. Thanks um, to both of you for that lovely introduction. Um, uh, I'll introduce my book by talking a little bit about how I got onto this topic. 
Um, when I began my master's degree in 2005, it started to occur to me, and it probably should have occurred sooner, but um, this was the point at which it occurred to me that livestock animals constitute a highly significant element of human history. Um, they were, at the very least, they are materially important in all kinds of ways to how most human societies function. And yet, as it seemed to me at the time, uh, they were largely absent from historical scholarship with a few notable exceptions. Work that fell under the heading of what was then an emerging field of animal studies tended to focus on um, symbolic and effective relationships with either pets or with wild animals, while the treatment of livestock animals by economic historians was largely numerical. Uh, it constituted, to my mind, what, what Will writes about as the dry food of statistics uh, in calculating values. Where was the cultural history of livestock animals? the story of their symbolic and social values, the recognition and analysis of their profoundly important place within human society and culture. Thus began my journey down the road to this book. It took me to MIT's program in History, Anthropology, and STS, both where Will now teaches, uh, where I discovered that my mentor, Harriet Riffo, had in fact answered a number of these questions within the context of Victorian Britain. Cattle, sheep, dogs, and horses were each, in their own ways, vehicles for the expression of a national identity as she demonstrated in uh, her, her great book, The Animal Estate. But if particular breeds of sheep and cattle were recognizably British to those who produced and consumed them, what happened when they were transposed to distant colonial places under the sign of expanding British Empire? Could such creatures remain British on new pastures, or did they become vehicles for the expression of novel cultural identities? These questions took me to both farms and archives in um, Great Britain, in Australia, and in New Zealand, where I discovered, um, to my initial disappointment and my eventual acceptance, uh, that uh, livestock breeders tend not to wax eloquent about the effective symbolism of their animals, <laughs> hence the uh, way in which animal studies seem to overlook cattle and sheep, and other four-footed multitudes. Uh, instead, I found a story about colonial environments, imperial economies, and uh, the breeds that forged the connections between them. I found that in the expansion of Britain, Britain's um, settler empire in the 19th century, breeds of sheep and cattle were crucial links between colonial producers and metropolitan consumers, a function they came to perform as artificial refrigeration enabled the colonies to remit their sheep and cattle to the imperial center as frozen meat. The significance of breeds came to constitute an analytical departure from uh, existing literature on animals, environment, and empire. Like any other work on this topic, I would venture to say, uh, mine is both engaged with and indebted to Alfred Crosby's foundational ecological imperialism. This is a study, both problematic and incredibly generative, of the role of non-human organisms in the establishment of new world places, new world colonies, and the eventual uh, demographic triumph of the West. Lots of air quotations there. Crosby's work has been subject to valuable critical revision, particularly on the point of the West's supposed demographic triumph, and it inspired almost countless subsequent studies, most of which took up his focus on species of animals as agents of political and ecological transformation in order to clarify how uh, imperial and colonial expansion works. I ended up arguing um, on a slightly different level that to understand the place of livestock animals within the British Empire, we have to, at least in the 19th century, we have to address our inquiry at the level of breed rather than species. Um, breeds, and a particular subset of them called native breeds, came to be crucially important. And I'm gonna use the time remaining, um, please keep me on task here, to do a brief reading from the introduction that kind of, I think, lays out um, why this is so. This is the level of greed at which we see the workings of imperial economy and cultural concerns collide. Focusing on subspecific distinctions is a powerful way to retell a familiar story of changing patterns of production and consumption at both the national and imperial scales. Cattle and sheep were not merely economic animals. Their fates were governed as much by cultural imperatives as by those of profit. Different types crafted over time in response to particular ecological contexts and economic circumstances evoked different responses on the market and produced different effects in various places. It thus is apparent that the processes of transformation were driven neither by ecological nor by economic concerns alone. 
Cultural signification, often articulated as a matter of taste, was central to the evolution of imperial livestock production in the 19th century and its attendant ecological consequences. The breeds of empire were not blunt tools of domination only, but subtle leaders of power, able to take hold of land, to sustain occupation over time and across economic circumstances, and to forge and maintain connections between the imperial center and the colonial peripheries. And their ability to do so came down to the perceived relationship between type and place, one that was filtered through the idea of native belonging. What native stood for was highly contingent. It was a crucial political, economic, and environmental signifier. It was and remains a powerful term. Assigning someone or something to this category could either justify or delegitimize its presence in a given place, but precisely how this played out was far from self-evident, as tracing its usage and meaning across context reveals. Native was malleable enough to be used for a range of interventions in national and imperial political economy. In Britain, it intersected with ideas about nationhood and citizenship. In the colonies, where Europeans were continually under pressure to legitimize their own presence, the term carried even more weight, especially in the face of indigenous, which is to say native, peoples whose occupancy evidently predated the arrival of Europeans. With respect to livestock, breeders sought to match particular types of sheep or cattle bred for a specific set of circumstances in Britain to roughly analogous colonial conditions. In this carefully calibrated process of imperial translocation, the significance of the term shifted from one designating British origins to one capable of encompassing novel notions of colonial belonging as well. So the answer to that question is yes, they changed. <laughs> the stakes of these discourses were highest with respect to people, but how they applied to breeds of livestock was by no means inconsequential. Most significantly, new so-called native colonial breeds supported colonist claims to foreign lands in the face of existing societies with obvious prior claim. They operated, in effect, as proxies for British people. In situations where human colonists feared the consequences, political, social, moral, and biological, of quote-unquote going native, British sheep and cattle could do so with relative impunity, thereby bol bolstering the legitimacy of imperial occupation, the expropriation of indigenous lands, and the disenfranchisement of indigenous peoples. The circulation of British breeds and the concomitant establishment of new so-called native colonial breeds are thus crucial to understanding how the question of colonial legitimacy, which is perhaps the central problem in imperial historiography, I'm uh, sorry, in imperialism and its historiography, was worked out on the ground and in the paddock. Thanks. Thank So uh, first I should say what a great delight it is to be able to read uh, Rebecca's book. Um, having really discussed many of the early parts of it um, when we were fellows together, um, I feel like I saw this book in a sort of formative stages of cultivation. Um, and now it's so exciting to see it flourishing far and wide around the world. Um, so at its heart, I see Rebecca's wonderful book as an ex exploration of the shifting meanings and values of two profoundly important but yet extremely slippery concepts. So what is nativeness? What it means for living beings, human, animal, or otherwise, to be native to a particular place? The other is naturalness. What it means to be natural, to be derived from, or in some sense, in accordance with nature. So the herd shot around the world tells of how British livestock breeders, agricultural improvers, and consumers wrestled with, to wrangle is definitely the right word here, <laughs> these two concepts across the 19th century moment when these ideas were under profound conceptual pressure. So the idea of nativeness had to be rethought, often in highly unjust and uneven ways, in a world increasingly defined by global entanglements, thanks in large part to the colonial incursions of the British Empire. And the idea of naturalness was constantly being reconceived as humans gain new scientific and technological capacities to control nature toward human ends, like techniques of agricultural improvement, selective breeding techniques, steam transport, and especially central to Rebecca's story, mechanical refrigeration. So this is a story in some sense about two entwined empires, the British Empire and what my uh, MIT colleague Rosalind Williams would call human empire. <clears throat> so Rebecca offers a vivid account of how changing notions of what it meant to be native and what it meant to be natural played out in the bodies of livestock animals, particularly sheep and cows over the course of the 19th century. So to give a brief sense of how this plays out, I want to offer a brief rendition of the story of one of the central characters in Rebecca's story, and that's the Hereford cow. 
Um, so this is the central character of chapters three and five. Um, in part because while I was here at the Society, I think I only ever heard about sheep, yeah. and so I never got to hear about cows. So this was the, in some ways the newest and most exciting part of the book for me. So as Rebecca explains, in the 18th century, uh, British agriculturists began to, def to refine the notion of an animal breed, some taxonomic category more precise than the species, in a way that initially emphasized the importance of place. The slogan of the day was, every soil has its stock. So what made a Hereford cow or a uh, steer a Hereford was that it came from Herefordshire, um, an English county on the border of Wales. Noted for its red body and white face, the Hereford initially was known as a hardy, multi-purpose breed, accustomed to spending years in front of the plow before making its way to the butchers, and until the middle of the 19th century, a rather uncouth variety, those are Rebecca's words, um, especially when compared with more prestigious rival breeds like the illustrious Shorthorn. Beginning in the early 19th century, enterprising breeders sought to improve the Hereford through strategic selection of breeding stock, particularly with an eye toward creating a breed that produced the tastiest and most abundant beef to feed Britain's increasingly voracious appetites for roast beef, particularly in the London metro area. At the same time they were deliberately tinkering in order to improve the breed, Hereford breeders imagined that what they were doing was nurturing some kind of pure, natural, ancient strain of cattle that was native to this particular area in Herefordshire. And in an age before a genetic theory of inheritance or basic technologies like herd books for tracking lineage, the Hereford had a certain advantage. It had a characteristic look, a white face and a red body that served as a powerful marker of authenticity. So partisans of the Hereford breed and one of the great joys of Rebecca's book is getting to watch the great lengths that 19th century agriculturalists would go to defend the honor of their favorite <laughs> livestock breeds. So Hereford per partisans uh, pointed to the close connection between the Hereford cow and the land of Herefordshire, county as the essence of the breed's quality as a beef producer. Yet, here's where things start to get strange. It turned out that the Hereford was capable of thriving in a wide variety of different places and environments, some very different and very far afield from Herefordshire. This mobility became the Hereford's greatest attribute, giving it a huge leg up on more finicky, finicky rivals like the Shorthorn. Over the 19th century, the Hereford began to expand across Britain and starting around the 1870s, across the globe, particularly in Anglophone regions in Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand, as well as areas of more informal British imperial influence like Argentina. Breeders in these far-flung regions imported Hereford bulls to improve their own motley local herds, often with an eye toward producing more and more beef to sell back to Britain, something now possible thanks to development of refrigeration. Overseas, the Hereford's cachet had less and less to do with anything about the county of Herefordshire, and more and more to do with the sense that it was native to Britain broadly construed. The Hereford became a kind of bovine ambassador for a certain vision of British native superiority overseas. What arose was a kind of paradoxical logic in which what made a native Hereford so valuable was its ability to thrive anywhere in the world. Um, and what is most de delicious about Rebecca's book is the way she explicates these really ironic contortions. Over time, the great success of the British Hereford was also, in a sense, its undoing. As Rebecca shows, breeders in Canada, the United States, and elsewhere gradually began to cultivate their own carefully selected breeds of Canadian Herefords and American Herefords. The pronunciation changes apparently. <laughs> producing cattle that were, quote, taller, meatier, and faster to reach maturity than the short legged and hardy but still maturing English Hereford. Beginning in the 1970s, English Hereford. English breeders, in turn, re-imported North American Herefords and crossed them with English Herefords, <laughs> leading to some to worry that the pure English type of the Hereford was going to be trampled out of existence by this backflow of post-colonial cattle. Rebecca ends her story by discussing recent efforts by organizations like the Rare Breed Survival Trust to preserve some pure English breeds, like the so-called traditional Hereford, which, as Rebecca explained to us, was essentially an artificial creation 
And so Becker writes in her concluding pages, anxiety over the purity and future of the traditional Hereford III coincided not only with the disintegration of the former British Empire, but also with the successive waves of immigration of former colonial subjects to Great Britain. As the more racially and culturally diverse population of Britain evolved in the late 20th century, the realm of breed conservation remained an unusual discursive space in which conversations about English purity and nativeness continued to take place rather unapologetically. Thanks to Rebecca for an extraordinary story that I'm sure will be heard around the world. <laughs> Six to eight minutes. Six to eight minutes. Yes. Okay. So uh, first of all, as uh, uh, someone whose family comes from a cattle-producing area of California, I assure you it's a perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is uh, I actually one of my earliest memories is of a very unfortunate encounter with a herder <laughs> when my father took me out to show me the farm where he worked as a boy. That was followed then by a terrible encounter with a goose. Uh, <laughs> uh, or as I've seen these things referred to more recently, uh, domesticated megafauna. So uh, here we are uh, to celebrate domesticated megafauna and the publication of Rebecca's really tremendous and great work. So in 1614, the Italian writer Scacco da Tagliacozzo uh, writes in the third book of, of his book of fairy. Uh, he speculates on what happens uh, if you, as a potential buyer of domesticated megafauna, you really wish to import Spanish horses, desirable for their nobility, their loyalty, uh, and other noble characteristics. Uh, and Thalia also explains that you can certainly import Spanish horses, but you shouldn't expect them to remain Spanish horses beyond a single generation. That is to say, he says quite specifically, they will not be true. Uh, that within the second generation, what you'll end up with is an Italian nag, and that is the thing that you didn't want in, in the first place. And Thalia Cotso himself may have had reasons for, for wanting to promote this idea. Often, men like Thalia Cotso made a living as brokers for the international sale of horses, but in essence, Tallecoso's argument that Spanish horses will not breed true in Italy, that they will become Italian nags, and that you will end up with the kind of horse that you didn't want in the first place was something that would have been eminently familiar to the actors in Rebecca's book. And although the question they would be asking is not, can you get a Spanish horse to remain Spanish on Italian soil, but what is British livestock when you shoot it around the world? Uh, as I was reading the book, I was thinking actually uh, about uh, Al Crosby, in fact, who you uh, invoked in your, in, your, in your introductory remarks and also you spent a certain amount of time in the, in the introduction talking about. Uh, and I was thinking about what this book does with Crosby's idea. Uh, and Crosby, of course, author of ecological imperialism, is responsible or guilty, depending upon how you want to see it, for. Uh, a fairly popular set of arguments in environmental history about the, not just the expansion of Europeans into what he calls Neo-Europe, so that is to say areas that are uh, climatologically similar to the places that Europeans left behind, but also as an explanation for why so many forms, uh, life forms, uh, biota of European origin can be found in these places. Now, Crosby, of course, uh, famously or infamously sees animals, domesticated livestock, livestock, and also animals like rats and weeds like the dandelion as agents of, uh, of empire, or the shock troops of empire, as what he calls portmanteau biota. And what I like so much about Rebecca's book is the way that it actually inverts this, and that the animals are not the agents of empire, but they are the objects upon which empire works out both its kind of anxieties and also its power to reshape the world. And its anxieties because, of course, as she said in her introductory remarks, the fate of animals, not Spanish horses when you go to Italy, but British sheep when you go to New Zealand or to Australia or uh, to the Caribbean uh, in the case of uh, the ill-fated attempts to, to uh, 
to introduce merino sheep into the Caribbean, which I really uh, I enjoy. That was my favorite part of the book. Uh, the, the sort of, and, and the notion that because the merino changed, these debates about whether or not they were changed by the climate of the Caribbean, and that that accounted for the fact that their lustrous wool became short and wiry, or whether in fact they had secretly interbred with some mysterious other kind of sheep that had already previously been introduced to the Caribbean, but nobody could actually find or identify. So that's an example of the anxiety of empire being played out uh, on the bodies of domesticated megafauna. But it's also the place where empire acts itself out also in terms of its confidence. And that you see in the bodies of the Corydale sheep that I, I had to confirm with Rebecca right before this, how to say it, because I had this, unlike the, unlike the Hereford, which I'm sure about, <laughs> the Corydale, I couldn't decide whether it was Corydale or Corydale. Uh, but uh, anyway, the Corydale sheep in New Zealand, which is an imperial breed. It is a type of sheep that was bred specifically uh, for the environment in New Zealand. And for those of you who don't know, actually, even though New Zealand is actually is Crosby's, uh, it's the centerpiece of the last chapter of ecological imperialism, it is the test case for, specifically, his notion uh, that Neo-Europe's are established, and, and, and he sees New Zealand as the, as, as the keystone piece of evidence. In fact, if you actually go look at the diaries of, of New Zealand sheep farmers, and the one I know is Guthrie Smith, man, they had a hard time. Uh, because, uh, especially uh, on the North Island where he was, the bracket was completely unsuitable for British sheep or merino sheep or sheep of any description, really. And the diary is this endless kind of slog of him trying to burn the bracket dig the bracken out and beat it down and, and, and somehow transform it. And each time he does this, it just comes back and the sheep gets sick and they die and he goes broker and broker and broker. And the Corydale actually, in a sense, resolves this problem or at least partially resolves this problem. And so it's the ability to breed a new imperial breed that produces the kind of meat that consumers back in, in Britain, crave, and through the magic of mechanical refrigeration it can be frozen in time and brought to them and then brought to their table, uh, that in a sense makes at least some version of the British imperial breed come true. And so what I like about the book is that it's not kind of Crosby's story, which has a kind of teleology to it, but also has this kind of he makes this grand causal claim. Once you have a certain body of portmanteau by and you send them out into the world, conquest will follow. But rather, that it's a story that's, that's profoundly ambiguous. It's a story in which the sheep are both kinds of, uh, of examples or, or, or display pieces for British success and also for every anxiety that the British ever felt, in fact, about what it meant to have an empire and be imperial themselves. And I'll just close on that note, uh, and uh, I'm glad you talked about, about the, the cows. I, I too saw lots of versions of this early on, uh, and I decided I wasn't going to talk about the cows. <laughs> so this worked out with no prior plan. Very nice. But I really want to congratulate Rebecca on a really terrific book. It's extremely readable. It's really fun, and I'm a big believer that scholarship should also be fun, uh, and I think uh, the herd shot around the world, you can tell it just from the time, is both really uh, a significant scholarly achievement and an awful lot of fun to read. So thanks for that. Thank you. So we'll now shift gears to a discussion of Will's book. <laughs> Um, so let me begin by saying thanks to everyone um, at for making this event happen. To Eileen, who is probably at the airport right now, um, uh, and Tess K, also to um, Heidi, Whitney, and Carl for joining us on the panel. Thanks to everyone in the audience for coming to celebrate. And finally, thanks to Rebecca and Matt for writing such exciting books and for agreeing to let my own modest efforts show the stage with them. So what I'd like to do is to offer a kind of digest version of 
some of the uh, introductory material from the book, figuring that I spent so much time on these sentences that I wasn't going to write new sentences. Um, so here it goes. We live in a quantitative age. One of the defining features of modern political culture is a widespread belief in the power of numerical calculations to explain how the social world works, to measure our collective well-being, to evaluate our institutions and hold accountable the individuals who govern us. Understanding, judging, and improving society means counting, measuring, and calculating. Numbers do not just depict, but define who we collectively are, what we think, and how we are doing. The economic strength of our communities is represented by a series of familiar numbers, the GDP and the CPI, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and the unemployment rate. Our political sentiments are quantified in an endless stream of polls. There are a few problems that do not seem somehow more solvable with the application of quantitative analysis. Quantitative procedures are transforming how we determine what teachers add the most value in their classrooms, how our streets are policed and justice is allotted, how we determine the most effective charities. Better calculations, it is imagined, will make a better society. Empowering all these projects is a prevailing sense that quantitative evidence and analysis are an especially powerful way of knowing about the world, somehow over and above their qualitative counterparts. Calculated values is about this special authority that quantitative thinking holds in modern culture, especially in the political domain. In the English-speaking world, the notion that numerical calculation was somehow deserving of special esteem as a way of knowing, particularly in political contexts, first began to take hold around 1700. Prior to that point, numerical thinking held a marginal place in political affairs. Though a certain amount of arithmetic had long been necessary in some areas of governmental practice, like the management of royal funds or navigation, Numbers held no particular cachet as a medium of political knowledge. In fact, well into the 17th century, quantitative thinking had been held in rather low esteem by many, particularly among the political and social elite, who saw calculation as the province of grubby artisans, covetous merchants, and sinister conjurers. In the debate that followed Britain's glorious revolution of 1688, though, numerical calculation became an expected, even exalted, part of political life and public culture. So how exactly did this happen? I'll offer one crucial clue. Um, and it can be found in the history of a familiar expression, which is the expression facts and figures. So the phrase facts and figures serves as a kind of talisman of modern quantitative culture. It adorns brochures and websites and call-out boxes and newspaper articles, identifying those uh, numerical figures most essential to understanding whatever's in question. Its presence evokes deep-seated attitudes about numerical knowledge and its proper place in public life. The first usage of this phrase in print comes from the year 1727. Its author was William Pulteney, a genteel English politician who had represented the Yorkshire borough of Heaton in the House of Commons in 1705. For his first 20 years in Parliament, Pulteney had been a devoted member of the Whig Party and a loyal ally to Robert Walpole. Walpole often called Britain's first Prime Minister. But the alliance between the two had deteriorated, and by 1727, Pulteney had become one of uh, Walpole's fiercest ally, fiercest critics. He directed much of his hostility towards Walpole's financial policies, especially regarding Britain's mounting public debts. Pulteney excoriated Walpole's fiscal record in a string of printed pamphlets, including a 1727 pamphlet entitled The State of the National Debt. Shortly before he published that uh, pamphlet, Whig advocates, supporters of Walpole, had triumphantly asserted that Walpole's wise policies had reduced the national debt by $2 million. Now, it's out talking about this today, but the CBO claims about what's happening to the deficit. Um, so it was exactly this kind of thing that people were arguing. Um, so Pulteney stridently disputed this notion that the debt that Walpole had reduced the debt by two million pounds, and he believed that he had the numbers on his side. So in his pamphlet, he presented a detailed numerical analysis tracing all of the government debts that had been incurred uh, between 1716 and 1725, using careful calculations to clarify this complex data and reveal the true impact of Walpole's policy. His conclusion was that over those nine years, the debt did not, in fact, have decreased by two million, but had actually expanded by almost eight million. The numbers Pulteney suggested revealed dire truths that Walpole and his supporters had tried to obscure. And Pulteney declared, facts and figures are the most stubborn evidences. 
They now neither yield to the most persuasive eloquence nor bend to the most imperious authority. So in some ways, Pulteney's ode to facts and figures seems familiarly modern. Right? The idea that quantitative data constitutes a specially strong form of evidence and that it's somehow more reliable or more robust than words. But in many other ways, William Pulteney's use of the expression facts and figures, his actual use of facts and figures, bears surprisingly little resemblance to the standard image that dominates today. Well, today we see facts and figures as the objective foundation of sound decisions and reasoned reason debates. We also see them as dull, mechanical, and emotionless. To a great degree, this tediousness is supposed to be part of what makes numbers trustworthy. They're imagined to be impartial, impersonal and impartial, free of opinion, emotion, and artifice. The facts and figures that filled Pulteney's pamphlets, though, were not dull, mechanical, or unimaginative. They were the product of deeply creative computational work by their author. Nor were they impartial, dispassionate, or impersonal, but unabashedly political, intended to score points in a partisan conflict, and to embarrass a political enemy. They were not cold and dry, but in fact a matter for a very heated kind of political dispute. Beginning in the late 17th century, calculations like Pulteney's became a fixture of, of British political life in parliamentary debates, in the internal deliberations of state, statesmen, and especially in mounting piles of printed pamphlets and newspapers. As in Pulteney's case, these calculations were almost always related to questions about money, Right? They concern taxation, government budgeting, import-export statistics, the stock market, and again and again, the national debt. And again, like Pulteney's case, what inspired these calculations was political antagonism. Britain's new calculating, calculating age was not fashioned by dispassionate scientific practitioners seeking objective knowledge about society or the economy, nor by diligent uh, bureaucrats trying to advance the interests of an enlightened state. Rather, it was political actors of various stripes, members of parliament, hack propagandists, out-of-work accountants, uh, who found that numerical calculation offered a remarkably useful tool for formulating political arguments. They used numbers to critique and defend public policies, to interrogate leaders, embarrass opponents, and uncover secrets. Pultini and his fellow calculators, they sometimes called themselves calculators, presented an unprecedented volume of numbers before the public. And these numerical controversies became a kind of engine for publicizing the virtues of numerical thinking. Partisan calculators disagreed fervently with one another about what the right numbers were on any given question. In fact, they never answered anything. They constantly debated things that never answered them. Yet their relentless calculating attempts to outcalculate one another fueled a kind of collective sense that numbers held crucial answers to the nation's essential political Put it another way, the era's political calculations, as in intensive numerical art analyses of political questions, were invariably entangled with political calculations, as in the strategic pursuit of partisan objectives. But the fact that numbers were used in these overtly political ways did not hinder Britain's confidence in quantitative knowledge, but actually did the opposite. It was in fact the deliberate use of calculation to carry out various political objectives that generated an unprecedented authority for numbers. And that irony is, the, is at the heart of the story that calculated values tell us. OK. Um, so if only we could all sit together and calculate uh, the Wilhelm Magnus news, we could reach consensus on the political and religious issues tearing our world apart. Generations of philosophers and mathematicians from Leibniz and Hobbes onward have seen in the icy shores of mathematical logic a millenary hope in, the, in, in an end time with no dissensus. Calculation, to be sure, dominates our world ever more, and yet consensus there is no Will's book is about that conjunction, and that conjunction in the 18th century. In calculated value, Will holds that the intertwining of contestation and calculation is essential for 18th century British history. Indeed, the prolixity and rhetorical violence swirling around numbers in British public today drove calculators to ever greater mathematical sophistication and rhetorical presentation, and indeed, to authority. So, my first slide. So, 
Will's book is delightfully structured with a wide array of apparent paradoxes. As politics in Britain became more polarized, numbers became ever more prized. The South Sea bubble was an argument for putting more faith in calculation, not less. Calculations did not necessarily need to provide certain answers to be politically powerful. It just needed to make good arguments. Highly polarized two-party politics proved incredible uh, and amenable, I misspelled it, to quantitative thinking in public life. In, par in, in examining paradox after paradox, each document a painstaking work with ephemeral pamphlets and um, periodical literature, Derringer shows, just as he said, that calculation did not in fact resolve political debate by providing a baseline objectivity. So Leibniz was wrong. He was way wrong. In fact, he was way, way wrong. <coughs> and yet, Derringer is not the mad postmodern relativist your parents and funding agencies warned you. <laughs> He's at pains ever to deny that calculation was merely rhetoric or merely argument equivalent to any other argument. He writes, controversies can produce a lot, even as they fail to produce answers. Now let's take an example, one that many readers probably will skip over as far too arcane from the middle of the book. To skip it would be their loss, so here's my second slide. Now, this is in the middle of, of the book, and it's an example on uh, the left side of the work by someone named Archibald Hutchison. And on the, on, on, on the right side is Will's reconstruction of what the argument is going on. Now, it's an amazing moment in the book because essentially what's happening is that Hutchison is attempting to discern from a, a, a set of possible valuations the South Sea, South sea Company might give to its stock, something about the, the opaque internal finance of the South Sea Bubble. It's precisely an object that can't be known. It's a thing in itself that can't be known. And what uh, Hutchison does is he provides both a series of numerical calculations, but also this profound rhetorical form for demonstrating them. He doesn't know which one is going to obtain, but he provides the entire array of financial scenarios in order to gain some knowledge into something profoundly opaque. Running through the scenarios allows Hutchison to unearth the obscure deliberations and, dare we say, metrics of an eagle megalith a new upstanding firm. <laughs> Quote, modeling multiple scenarios, Will writes, was his strategy for dealing with informational uncertainty. Now, of course, we need today such activities to piece, pierce through the algorithms of a Facebook, whatever the latest Uber for cats. <laughs> so, now, in, in, in Will's account, resistance to opacity is at the heart of the making of new words. Resistance to the opacity in the first part of the book of the crown, and in the second half of the book, as much as financiers and corporations, led to manifold new techniques that serve <coughs> as numerical proxies for obscure knowledge and rhetorical forms, such as these proto-spreadsheets, to push new probabilistic forms of knowledge into the tumble of public debate. Following people such as Ted Porter, Derringer argues that the increasing role of calculation was not primarily driven by state seeing, a la James Scott or Foucault or others, or up to, to, to the state wanting to know, or to a conspiracy of financial interests. It is precisely weaker agents attempting to push accountability that produces so much of our world. Princely political combat using numbers realized their legitimacy in some sense, through a political combat about that legitimacy. Could numbers be gained? As Will shows, yes, and how. But it was precisely a consciousness of the politicization of calculation, which he argues, spurred the development and reflection on the assumptions behind sets of calculation. Best of all, he argues, it spurred a variety of diverse practitioners to fight about and with numbers. So numbers were not just argued about in, 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 in warm manners. It is precisely that they were investigated by a plurality of different sorts of people contesting their validity. And this led to both challenges to the procedures of using them and the ways of uh, unpacking their assumptions. So all of this sounds good. Factions are good. Should we be ruling? It sounds like it's our time. Will ends in a remarkable normative note about what is different now 
what, do you, what we need now, he concludes, is more diverse fights about numbers. We need more people contesting numbers. But sadly, we're in a situation in which antagonism to numbers has become an antagonism to a small set of people who are arguing about the numbers, rather than diverse communities arguing about the validity of numbers and their assumptions. So he offers us, I think, hope not for less factionalism, but a factionalism more engaged in quantitative not less. Thank you for your wonderful book. So, uh, excuse me, I'd like to echo uh, a lot of what Will said about the, the pleasure of being here, um, of being on the panel, being in such illustrious company. Um, I think this is, I can probably safely say it's the only time I'll sit on a panel with two books that are about, in their own ways, the history of that matter. Um, <laughs> and it was really, I really, uh, I mean, I loved reading both of them, and I particularly um, like Will, was engaged as a fellow of this community in seeing earlier um, iterations of parts of this book, and it was a true pleasure to see um, the form it took, the exceptional form it took in its printed version. Um, Will's book is a brilliant examination of what he calls civic epistemology in the making, a masterful reconstruction of the emergence of Britain's first quantitative age. His attention to the politics of calculation, as Matt has so nicely laid out for us, and to calculation as an instrument, and we might even say a technology of dispute, that is, uh, it's the way in which it was about politicking, made me think of what is still, to my mind, the classic account of technopolitics. This is the notion that the, um, it, the, it refers to the pursuit of political ends by means of technologies, whether through design or their use or both. And that classic account is Gabriel Hecht's Radiance of Friends, which does a lot of, uh, I mean, in, in some ways I see it's kind of like a parallel book about France's post-war nuclear program, because like Will, it's a diachronic history of the, the kind of growth and transformation of certain technologies, in her case, nuclear reactors, in Will, Will's case, these, the kinds of um, financial tools and calculations that Matt um, showed us so nicely from the book. And I was wondering if it's not too much of a, a stretch to, to coin a neologism, calculopolitics? <laughs> Especially now that you're uh, in, in, an SDS professor, you've got you to do the word coining. Well. Um, <laughs> Will gives us an account of the rise of calculation as a political tool, and like Hecht and others, and I would include Matt here in with his reckoning with matter, he insists that the form, the nature of the matter of the instrument matters. He opens the black box of calculation, the complex numerical formations of political arguments. And this is a classic SDS move, um, to put and he puts them to new use in the history of finance. I'm really glad that you were prepared enough to produce a slide to show us exactly how Will does that in this book. But his account of the rise of quantification as an instrument of political dispute in early modern Britain is also a deeply humanist one. And here I really agree with Matt um, in, his, in his take on Will's book. And this is part of what makes it a unique contribution, not only to SDS and the history of science, but more broadly to the historiographies of Britain, of finance, and of capitalism. This is no simple tale of the ascent of objectivity as is so often told about the, the kind of growing power of numbers and the rise of numeracy in the modern age. Political calculations were taken up in the moment following Britain's glorious revolution, not because they were more rational than alternative modes of engagement, but precisely because they could be marshaled in support of varied particular positions. Numbers were and are good to argue with. Maybe are good to argue with, that's think about but neither, in Will's telling, is this a cynical story of mere political expediency and numbers. They can't be made to say anything at all, as is clear from reckoning with reckonings. That is, by opening up that black box of past calculations to look at their form and substance. This methodology leads Will to stake out a position between the extremes of objectivity on one hand and cynicism on the other, radical relativism, and thereby to offer what may be a more realist and is certainly a more human place for calculation as a tool of political dispute. The stakes of this work could not be higher. With the current political climate in the United States so heavily partisan, so starkly divided, with President Trump and many of his supporters disavowing any kind of truth in numbers or narrative alike, and with the mounting evidence of 
foreign interference in the uh, recent presidential election is more important than ever, as Will reminds us, to take seriously this flexibility of political calculation and their utility as a mode of dispute in order to bridge the chasm in American politics. Whether or not calculating values solves the impasse of American politics, it will certainly leave its mark on the scholarly community. And I think, in particular, it will do so because of its, um, its uh, really incredible and generative blend of SCS and history of science. I think that this is, we're looking at the future people. Uh, I remember Bill Cronin waving an iPad around at a conference once doing that, but I think that it's true with calculated values. I think that Will's, um, Will's, Will's laying out a methodological blueprint here, much as the way Heck did with um, the Radiance of France for how to do a certain kind of um, sociology of knowledge that many people will take up and apply, and this will become the kind of um, passage point for future generations of STS scholars and historians of science. So thanks, Will. So, in 1834, Charles Babbage wrote a letter demanding things. He did this with regular He wrote to the Duke of Wellington, and he said, uh, he, he, was, he wanted more money, of course, and he said, you know, there's nothing that I have more ownership in than my intellectual property in this device. Absolutely. And it's, a, and it's an often quoted letter that is it's breathtaking, breathtakingly modern, it seems, in its envision of intellectual property and the creation, in, in intellectual creation, as a, as a, as a and, it's, and it's a letter that is, of course, belied entirely by everything we know about the sociology, sociology and history of technology. Without dropping a note, Babbage turns to another way of speaking. He says, and if you don't give me the money, I'm going to take all of my artisans and everything in my workshop, and I'm going to move. <laughs> I'm going to move to France, and you know what? That's going to be terrible. Why? Because they're going to get all of the knowledge of my artisans, and that's even more important than my device. Now, what I love about this letter is that it captures a figure who is often taken as a key emblem of modernity, someone whose works are often held to have a sort of causal force, or if not that, are held to be a marker of what the transformation at the beginning of the 19th century is. And yet, he has one foot in that whole range of ways of rethinking, say, the political economy of invention, uh, uh, intellectual accounts of invention. Um, but the other foot is firmly in the world of an early modern artisanal practice and the danger of moving to a different uh, monarchy, duchy, or other sort of thing. Now, I mention this because I wanted in this book to look at a moment that we call early modernity and look at possible modernities as they were envisioned at the moment of the time. And I use calculating machines to do this. Calculating machines, by virtue of their sometimes famous makers, are moments where there's accumulations of documents, documents both about their constitution, the arguments for why they should receive princely protection, patronage, and documents about their philosophical significance. There are nodes in which documents circulate around, and therefore ways of us getting into histories we might not otherwise have. Now, one of the uh, challenges that I faced is that I had very famous philosophers in the 17th century who failed, and I had to make machines that worked in anyone's mind, and I had Babbage who failed to make a machine that worked in anyone's eyes. And in between that, I had a vast array of people who'd produced machines, and some of them worked a lot better. I had a whole range of enlightenment machines, and I didn't know what to do. And it was, in fact, a conference that Will organized that I sort of began to figure out what was going on. That the question of uh, imitation and emulation were indeed central to my story, and central to retelling something about both the actual constitution of technologies uh, in the late 17th through early 19th century, and the ways they were discussed in aesthetic and philosophical facts. So a central leitmotif in the middle part of my book is Leibniz's failure. Everyone tells the story of how poor Leibniz, the greatest genius, failed. 
again and again, despite having spent 20,000 of whatever currency you want to mention in the story story. And that, it became fascinating why this was told again and again, as a structuring story of a, a genius who failed, and yet had provided the valorization of the object that is producing a calculator machine. Throughout the 18th century, a wide variety of people create new versions of calculating machines, none of them based on Leibniz's machine as well, much we know. And they do so within a very different organization of labor and the mind than Leibniz had been able to achieve. Um, and, and so I look at uh, the, these varieties of these machines and the settings in which they're in, in, and the reasons why they were often offered to princes. Now, one of the, uh, I was very lucky, and it's one of those things that happens occasionally as a historian who actually goes to the archive, which I hadn't been until I started writing this book, um, that I sort of, on a whim, before my grandmother was running out, my sabbatical coming out, said, oh, there's this archive in Maidstone, Kent, and it might be worth it. It says there's two folders. I said, well, honey, can I go for four days? Um, and I arrive, and I'm, I'm in the, the, the county archive uh, in Maidstone, Kent, and I bring, they bring out the two folders, and it is the most scrupulously documented set of, uh, um, uh, a set of papers about almost any early modern invention. The, the person's name is the Earl Stanhope. And Stanhope is a remarkable figure. He's the only member of the House of Lords to support the French Revolution. And he gained his education in technological things in Geneva as a Republican. And what he did, it turns out in the papers, was a, he, he, in that he created, he transformed his estate into a kind of workshop for the production of technological things and blew most of his fortune doing it. But he was self-conscious. The conditions under which you could transform artisanship and reunite the theoretical with the practical required such a concrete workshop experience. The reason I found this so, so significant is that it helped us think differently about the relationship of theory and practice theory and artisans, theoreticians. And so a lot of the history of science has been quite rightly focused on practice. There's been an artisanal turn. But much of the 18th century is the dynamic in, in England, in, in, in much of Europe, is precisely how do we need to transform theoreticians to be more like artisans, and how do we need to transform artisans to be more like theoreticians. It's a dynamic with not a single answer. And here was a case study that let me see one example in the granular detail, sort of thing that historians are supposed to do, and I was very gratified if I'm not doing that. So finally, um, and picking up from something Will just said, I was interested in the fact that almost no one in the early modern period is worried that machines are going to replace our models. As Will said, calculation was a debased activity. When Hobbes compares thinking to calculation, in, the Levi in Leviathan and elsewhere, he's way out in left field, even more so for him. This is just not something very many people believe or take up for several centuries. So I was interested in reconstructing the world in which artificial intelligence is not a central concern. Um, and the reasons why calculation and higher reasoning were and weren't uh, central. Um, and in particular to note that in the philosophical accounts of the kinds of sociology of technology that we find in places like the Earl Stanhope's workshop, um, a discourse of genius is not in opposition to imitation. It's not. And so I end, one of the things I end the book with is that at the, and towards the end of one of his most famous writings on artificial intelligence, uh, Alan Turing puts a knife twists a knife in the idea of genius. He says, who are we to say that everything we know hasn't just been learned from other sorts of people? Um, and it's a signal irony, because in histories of computing that are focused on an ideational story, Turing is the transformative figure. And yet that's a sociology of knowledge that Turing himself firmly rejected. So, thank you. Matt's book, Reckoning with Matter, is a forceful account of early computational technologies and philosophies in which he insists on the profound implications, as just been telling us, of the philosophy of computation with its material manifestations. This is a position 
that contradicts much of the historiography of computing, as well as which challenges that of early modern natural philosophers themselves. There's a, the book is rife with these like great moments in which the, the, the hubris of the natural philosopher um, uh, and the assumption that it'll be so easy to put, uh, it's just a mere matter of putting the ideas into material form, you know, kind of like comes crashing down on their heads with, with like the expenditure of huge amounts of whichever currency, pounds, um, um, francs, and so forth. Um, invention in general, and particularly, perhaps particularly when it comes to inventing computational devices, is assumed to go a little like this. A genius has an idea, he, and it's always he, works it out in his head and or on paper, and then somebody less brilliant but very dexterous materializes it under the direction of said genius in the real world. This is the classic mind-hand distinction that has long bo bolstered uh, not only the idea of the low genius himself, but has also justified the subordination of technology to science more broadly. In his examinations of early efforts to build computational machines, in particular, how such efforts addressed in theory and in practice the critical problem of the carry, and this is this like really uh, incredible and repeated example in which everybody, uh, almost everybody who tries to build a computational device from um, Pascal to Babbage has to has to deal with the problem of how you carry a one, a, a one. and I and I feel like the, I feel like it's a testament to to both Will and Matt that I can even speak about these books um, because <laughs> I am I, I, I am a sadly non numerical person, but they're both um, such excellent educators in the in the kind of mathematical. So I'm totally butchering how it works, but <laughs> Matt has great kind of diagrams in the book to work for readers for readers like me about how you know the carry you carry the one and this creates um, a, a really pretty intractable intractable problem um, in terms of putting it into a machine. I hope you have a, a better thought out example of this in your comments. <laughs> um, anyway, it's the problem with the carry. Um, and Matt shows convincingly that it is in fact impossible to separate the philosophical from the material, the ide ideation from the processes of instantiation, which is to say that Pascal and Leibniz and Babbage, they all thought they knew how to solve this problem, but when it came to actually building a machine that could achieve um, a, a really, a really like, complicated sequence of carries, it was incredibly difficult to do. Invention was, and perhaps is, of necessity, a deep and often problematical collaboration between skilled artisans and natural philosophers. Building a computer in the 17th century required all kinds of forms of knowledge and skill beyond the mathematical. And I should actually say, I mean, I, I don't think that's true just for the early modern period that Matt writes about, but um, into the present as well. It required social, social knowledge um, of who skilled artisans were and where to find them. It required experiential knowledge of the material world, of um, how springy a spring was, of how particular metal or particular wood might work in conjunction with other parts. And crucially, building computational devices requires skill at assembling and managing the expertise of others, an historical insight that sits uncomfortably with classical depictions of the isolated genius of the inventor. inventor. And in many ways, Matt shows how um, Leibniz's failure is uh, down to his inability to manage Olivier, his, his very kind of uh, temperamental and capricious and, and brilliant artisan who is supposed to be, you know, putting the plans into, merely putting the plans into action, but is in fact much more of a collaborator. Um, one of the things I liked best about this book was its blend of the history of philosophy and the history of labor. I wasn't expecting to find labor history in Reckoning with Matter, but the emphasis on making and doing as critical to the, philosoph to the phil philosophy of computation brings the workshop into equal focus with the philosopher's study, and this was a really delightful surprise. By bringing the reader into the workshop, through, for example, the correspondence between Leibniz and Olivier. I love the part where uh, 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 Leibniz's intermediary tries to track Olivier down. He just like doesn't show up at the workshop. They can't find him. Um, this, this kind of granular account 
um, to borrow Matt's phrase from a moment ago, um, for me evoked the, the world of Robert Darnton's great cat massacre. Um, and there's something about the texture, for me as a, a historian of the modern period, there's something about the texture of the early modern world that really um, came through in the book that I, I just, I love. It's a sort of, um, a, you know, the, the past is a strange country kind of um, uh, a moment which um, really resonated for me in this book. But Matt's contributions are not limited to the early modern period or even to the history of computing. Like uh, Will's book, Calculating Values, Reckoning with Matter holds insight for how we as historians, particularly those of us who are historians of science and technology, understand important concepts, important themes in, um, you know, these go beyond just uh, the scholarly community of historians, but how we understand invention and innovation as a society. And this, uh, again, is never more uh, a more pressing concern than at this moment when we see uh, contemporary inventions and innovations like Facebook just running haywire um, in our society. With perhaps a few very rare exceptions, the degree of collaboration between thinkers and artisans, that close marriage of ideation to materialization, the choreography of mind and hand that Matt tracks is carefully in this book, um, these make the attribution of credit for um, a creation or an invention so difficult to allocate as to render that activity entirely questionable, if not totally futile. This forces us to think of new and more sophisticated and perhaps more honest ways to account for technological change and development. Reckoning with matter will be the starting point for any who attempt to do so. So I'm glad you mentioned the carries. I hadn't planned to talk about the carries because I thought someone would, but it's really- like, I was hoping that I have a few hundred slides. Right, <laughs> but just, to, just to reiterate. Um, the core, the the core problem of building a cathode machine is figuring out how to carry that one when you add, you know, two digits and nine and eight, and you put the seven, <laughs> you move the one up, because it causes all of these physical problems. And that explains this in, in this wonderful detail. One is that um, it requires a lot of force because you have to find a way to propagate it through a whole bunch of dials. Another is that if you're trying to carry and then you add it to two numbers that also have a carry, the machine jams. Like, so it's really, they have all these really interesting mechanical problems, and much of it was, uh, I mean, one of the really amazing achievements is just the work that Matt does to understand how these machines were put together. As Matt said, one of, one of the kind of themes within the book is, is about how, particularly in the 18th century, various artisans tried to figure out what other people had done before them. And there's a way in which Matt kind of reenacts that persona of, of kind of looking through, you know, existing museum pieces, through drawings, through letters, through uh, various textual sources of, of trying to in some ways kind of re-inhabit um, both the machines and, and the people who made them. So that was all just an additional side about the carry, which is just a really, it's really nice. Um, so when I first started reading Matt's book, I'll admit I had a certain preconception about what it was going to be about. Um, and I bet I'm not the only person for whom this is the case. So seeing that it was about calculating machines and thinking about thinking, I suspected that it was going to sort of be a prehistory of artificial intelligence. Right? That it was that I assumed that the history of calculating machines was primarily interesting for what it revealed about the history of ideas about the human mind and for understanding the development of anxieties, acute as they've ever been now, about the mechanical nature of human thinking and the possibility uh, for good or ill of replicating mind with machine. And that book kind of plays coyly with this sort of lingering anxiety. Um, it does take on this theme uh, quite directly, particularly in the final chapter, uh, in chapter six, um, in which he coyly reveals why the book was not in fact about um, as he explained, and he touched on this in his opening remarks, despite the fact that enterprising philosophers, engineers, and artisans were trying to build calculating machines across the 17th and 18th century, no one in the period really thought deeply about, let alone worried about, the notion that those machines would somehow replace intelligent human thought. So Matt puts it, calculating machines 
were not particularly good to think with in the 18th century to make sense of human reasoning. Contemporary conceptions of human reasoning were such that a thinking mind and a calculating machine were so radically different that one could never be the replacement for the other. Predominant theories of mind understood knowledge as the accumulation of ideas and reasoning as the building of creative connections or <coughs> associations between them. So reasoning was not kind of algorithmic in any real sense. This was even true for those 17th and 18th century thinkers who thought of the mind in materialist terms. So even the people who thought that the mind might be kind of like a machine, they didn't think it was like a calculated machine. As Matt writes, any machines capable of emulating human thought to these sort of materialist thinkers would necessary, necessarily be less a metal calculating automaton than a bundle of sensitive interlinked vibrating strings. So this is one of these like great kind of uh, sort of almost sidebars into uh, kind of early modern uh, intellectual history that we get in this book. So the artificial angle sort of serves as this kind of cheeky red herring. And I'm kind of curious um, to know whether this, whether you set out to write a book about the prehistory of artificial intelligence and discovered that you were writing a different book, or you always knew it was not going to be about that. Um, but nonetheless, Matt's book is uh, profoundly concerned with a key question in the history of human intelligence. Not in the ability of the human mind to do calculations, but in the ability of the human mind to create new things. So I read Reckoning with Matter is fundamentally a history of a, a kind of intellectual and cultural and social um, and material history of invention and the changing nature of invention and what it means uh, from the 17th to the 19th century. So at the center of Matt's argument, and Rebecca I think laid this out even better than I, than I could, is, um, is a kind of critique of a sort of default modern understanding of how invention works that it begins as some kind of original insight in the mind of an inventor, again, always a male inventor, probably enlightened by some kind of abstract knowledge, um, who is then able to kind of comprehend some essential design and sort of instruct it into material form without any um, kind of difficulty. Matt calls this the, the hylomorphic model of invention after anthropologist Tim Eagle. So Matt's argument in some sense is what of the book is concerned with taking on two sort of implicit assumptions in that argument. One is that this default model assumes a kind of rigid division between the design, the sort of original idea of an invention, and its material execution. And I think Rebecca explained the many ways in which Matt kind of um, sort of undermines, sort of shows the kind of um, problems with that model. Secondly, uh, the, this default model assumes that invention depends on some fundamentally dramatic moment of originality. Right? We now think we sort of celebrate originality, this moment, this kind of qualitative leap whereby the innovator escapes the limits of everything that has come before and creates something that is thoroughly new. And it's it, in Matt's sort of meditation on that kind of idea that I found myself particularly um, struck by Matt's book. Uh, Matt takes on, when he takes on these two sort of assumptions of the kind of hylomorphic model, he really does it in, in two ways. He both shows that they weren't true in fact as a description of how invention actually worked. In some sense, that's, that's something that historians and sociologists and technology have known. But Matt combines that with a different kind of critique, which is where I find really the most sort of surprising, um, which is he shows us that before a certain period in the early 19th century, other people who were engaged in invention did not think that that was how invention worked either. So he resuscitates a really an alternative kind of theory of what invention was. Um, and this is particularly true across the last three chapters of the book, um, when Matt recaptures the dramatically different ways that early modern thinkers and makers thought about the inventive process. And the crucial point that Matt mentioned this in his opening comments, was that instead of fetishizing originality, early modern philosophers, artisans, even the occasional political economist, um, celebrated emulation as essential to creativity. So more than just aping or imitation, emulation was the thoughtful, skillful process whereby experienced observers could take a previous work of art, art understood broadly, be it a painting um, or a complicated machine, figure out how it worked, and remake it in a way that both celebrated the essential achievements of the original and improved upon them. 
Um, one interesting, another interesting kind of sidebar, Matt explains that um, this is essentially what the Swiss watch industry is built upon. Right, that the Genevan um, watchmakers, the, the Genevan wa watchmaking industry began as a self-conscious sort of political slash technological project on the part of Genevan artisans and the Genevan state to emulate the cutting edge horological achievements of who, the people who were then the leaders in the watchmaking industry that were provincial. So Matt Trice's emulation in theory and practice, uh, notably in his wonderfully titled fourth chapter, entitled Reinventing the Wheel, um, Emulation in the European Enlightenment, in which he focuses on this particular chain of emulative projects carried out largely by German artists and inventors that started with, as Matt noted, this failed design of, the, of Leibniz's um, at the beginning of the century. Matt's rich and generous reconstruction of this earlier theory of emulative creati creativity really struck me, in large part because it made me realize just how much I have been unthinkingly captive to the modern fixation on, on originality. I really did have this moment of sort of being struck by kind of finding it almost hard to believe that 18th century uh, thinkers could have thought that emulation was something other than a kind of second-rate derivative form of, uh, form of thinking. Fortunately, Matt's book also helps to diagnose the historical origin origins of this fixation on originality. So while 18th century thinkers celebrated emulation, over the 19th century, uh, thinkers driven by a, a variety of different forces, new philosophical models of mind, a romantic conception of individual genius, the new, product, new productive capacities of industrial technologies, um, increasingly came to, to sort of identify the individual spark of originality as in some sense the essence um, of invention. And I think he also notes that it is only at that point that people begin to work begin to also have these correspondent anxieties that the human mind might be overtaken by machines. Right? So this assumption that I also had going into the book, that this was going to be about artificial intelligence, is also in some sense a product of this 19th century transformation. So it's a really wonderful book, and it's with profoundly ambivalent feelings that I conclude by saying that, Matt, you have written a remarkably original book. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a great connection. I never thought about. I mean, there is something like profoundly emulative about breeding. It's like you're uh, the people who do it, and and again, it's like theory and practice. All of these issues kind of bound up into the people who do it are aware that they're um, that you know that that they that it. I think that um, that. It's, a, it's an attempt to kind of get future generations to emulate in a really um, um, predictable way past generations. Um, and there are lots of ways in which a livestock animal is like a work of art. Um, 
I, I, and this is all coming out of, this is all kind of coming out of stuff that I did in preparation for the book that never made it into the book, um, except in very, very limited ways, which was to go around and bug readers about what they were doing. I was like trying in a small way to be like an anthropologist. Um, and uh, one, when I, I had a conversation with one reader in particular in England who, um, who was a, a conservator of pure English Herefords, and um, I asked him, like, you know, how 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 will you know when you've like gotten to the point you want to be your reading? And he pulled out, he literally pulled out a herd book from the 1920s and opened it up to a picture of one particular animal and was like, that when it looks like that, that's how I'll know. So they're like, they're really, at, like, consciously emulating, consciously and of necessity emulating, you know, past past versions. These vehicles for English. So in the spirit of this resonance, I have to, can't blame that this is who's speaking. Uh, maybe there are different variations on this question. Uh, it has to do with counting sheep. So, I know, no, because the question that, that I, I would say one of the commonalities, of course, if we, if we take sheep and, you know, cows and so on as options to be counted, as well as me, uh, is that we're, we're, we're kind of spending a lot of very, we're visiting, at least in brief presentations, the, the world of objects in an unfamiliar way, whether it's through originality and linkers and so on, or work, or, or that the numbers turn out not to be quite as numerical, let's say, as, as we might imagine. Uh, I wonder about the other side, like the subject, the, the, the side of the subject. Who's doing the, you know, what is it to count? Who's doing the counting? And, and not so much to what end, in the, in the sense of instrumentality that we might ascribe either to the numbers or to the mechanisms, uh, but but to the to the, to the historical, as it were, emergence of, of a subject who could be called modern uh, in the various ways that we're describing, including one that has to be uh, you know put in relation to animals. Uh, so I don't know. I, just, I guess I'm just asking, who is the subject who comes sheep with machines? Of <laughs> um, okay, I, so I mean, one of the, the major contestations is precisely what are the competencies that are there in the game? There's been, uh, as Rebecca indicated, this kind of hand versus mind um, and a discussion of the mindful hand. And uh, I'm also interested in what you might call the handful mind. That is, it really is a, a question of how, how is it that one is going to obtain these? The, the, these competencies, um, and th those are going to involve questions, as, as Rebecca brought out, of social knowledge of other people's competencies, and what we would might think was organizational managerial knowledge. Um, one of the remarkable things about this category of emulation, at least, is it's actually drawn from Aristotelian studies, um, and it's a, it's a moral point. Uh, and, and Kant spends a lot of time and changes his mind dramatically about what this is. And, and he changes his mind at the moment he decides Newton is no longer a genius, because he's not original. And, he, and he's merely a um, So it's really at the heart of our understanding of what it is that allows us to become the kinds of people who can do things. And emulation is precisely an activity of both embracing the facets of, a, of an object, in, in some sense, overcoming it without having any illusion that one has distanced oneself from a causal story of the production of that kind of thing. And, 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 and late 18th century and 19th century aesthetics spends a lot of time trying to break that chain because they need to. Whereas much of 18th century aesthetics doesn't need to. Precisely the creation of a subject is one uh, in which that's not necessary. And often, it's interesting that we'll say what literature needs to be more like is a technological invention, because technological invention involves this improvement over, over time. Uh, and, and that's where our greatness will come to be. So um, I didn't mention this, and Will's a wonderful, wonderful material about the constitution of the people, and then the systematic forgetting of them. Um, uh, that I think is one of the, uh, it's an extraordinary, uh, it's a extraordinary moment in the midst of the political conversation. Yeah, so the, the, the chapter that's talking about, one of the 
It was actually one of the things that took me the longest to sort of figure out in my book, was to kind of figure out who it was, um, who it was that was doing these calculations, and how did they come to, to be? And for a long time, I was thinking about them in terms of, um, well, these are a certain kind of expert. And I had this moment sitting in my office upstairs where I had this like real profound realization that they were not experts, right, in, in a certain weird way. They had very tech, clear technical skills of certain kinds. They came at it from all these different points of view. Literally, there are almost no two characters in my book that have a similar background. So you know, one person comes from you know, working in the you know, overseas trade in, in Livorno and gets accused of being a pirate. And one is a lawyer who ends up as the attorney general in the Leeward Islands. You know, and one of them is a Unitarian minister. I mean, they really come from all of these. But they happen upon a similar sort of set of skills and get involved in these kinds of uh, uh, fights. And what I realized is that they weren't experts in the sense that no one in the community, with very sort of rare ex sort of exception, accorded them any special kind of esteem or, or identified them in any particular positive way. So I spent much of the book, or much, much time kind of wondering how I would talk about these people. And so I decided to call them calculators, because occasionally they called themselves calculators. But that was almost always a term of abuse, because it was seen as a kind of a negative, uh, you know, the, the, someone who was a calculator was sort of calculating in a kind of negative sense. Um, so what I realized was kind of happening was that there was this odd kind of group of people who were you had discovered that they could use these sort of computational skills to kind of make different kinds of, of lives. Um, but that they ended up making this form of knowledge that increasingly gets sort of detached from them. So all the people, the vast majority of the people in my book end up kind of a little bit forgotten. There's very few famous people. Many of them end up trying to sort of, in, in, as in that's but kind of doing all of this work and trying to get attention and it never happens, yet their numbers kind of persist, you know, and sort of float in the world, sort of separate from them. Um, and I think there is a real a kind of transitional moment here. Um, and one of the other kind of themes that I wrestle with a lot in this is about, um, is about the kind of personality sort of, thing of, of sort of different kinds of governmental roles and different kinds of relationships to information. So the world that, it, that kind of my book starts in is a world in which, uh, for you know, government agents who are responsible for collecting taxes or paying debts, um, you know, or also kind of merchants who are you know keeping accounts, everything is intensely personal. The, the money that they have, they, 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 there's no sort of collective kind of public resources, right? It's all just a bunch of people who have individual sort of spheres of influence, and if they, you know presented a, a kind of some sort of account or something where it was deeply connected with their own personhood, with their own virtue. Um, and over time, you get this world in which there's this kind of realm of, of sort of information that exists somehow and belongs to the public, right? And somehow exists that the public sort of thinks that it ought to have ownership over, that is somehow divorced from this sort of um, individual so there is this, in many ways it's a story of, the, of, of kind of alienation, right? of people who, who kind of have, you know, sort of losing control over these particular sort of realms of, uh, of knowledge and action and then, and then kind of um, trying to, to sort of rest them back. So I think with that, and I know Rebecca, I feel like cutting you off. I was just going to say that I'm like the wrong person to answer that because anytime, and I feel so guilty admitting this, but anytime I saw numbers, I would like, you know, like, just turn the page. <laughs> so I don't know who's counting the sheep. <laughs> but, but, but either the day, that's the point. I mean, the, the people who do the actual counting are like three steps removed in anonymity from the people who are who, who can even be insulted by calling them yeah. the calculators. I mean, so, so I, you know, I, I, I've done a lot of accounts, uh, <laughs> and and that's the thing. The people who are actually doing the counting, who the hell knows who they are. And, and it is a little bit like the artisans, uh, that uh, they're being directed by somebody, go out and tell me how many trees there are, go out and tell me how many head of sheep there are, and then they have some technique that varies about how they decide how many sheep there are, or how many, but they're, 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 we'll never know who they are, what they think. All we know are the people who are actually engaged with the numbers that those people are handing to them. Those people are the calculators, but they're not actually counting any 
just trying to make meaning out of these weird aggregations of data. So yeah, trying to make meaning out of weird aggregations of data is going to be our ending note. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you could join me in thanking uh, our panelists, um, thank you so much for your wonderful books, thank you so much for your wonderful responses, <laughs> um, and uh, I look forward to the, continuing the discussion in the lounge with our drinks and snacks. So you can join me.